So last week we learned about Dalibert's solution of the wave equation, which is a solution form that's valid for the infinite interval. Okay, so this kind of moves us on from looking at Fourier series to waves on infinite intervals. And we found that the solution u of x d of a wave equation can be written as half of f of x minus cp plus f of x plus cp. And then there's a component here, which is a 1 over 2c times an integral of x minus ct to x plus ct of a g function. And this component here corresponds to the initial velocity of the function, of the, the initial velocity condition. So we're going to assume for um, all of the practical sketching problems that you'll see in this course that that component is zero. So you always assume that the initial displacement um, is specified. Uh, and non-trivial, but the initial velocity is zero. And we interpret it as this solution form as if we were to give you an initial displacement, then in order for you to, to sketch what the solution looks like as a function of time, you would think of that initial displacement as being collapsed into two identical ways of half height, one moving to the left at a given speed c, and the other moving to the, to the right at a given speed c. And we looked at a very simple example um, that was on the right there, where your initial wave was 2 and then 0. OK, so you would take this initial wave. You think of it as being decomposed into a wave of half height of height 1. And then this, these two waves, which are lying right on top of each other, one will move towards the right, and the other will move towards the left. Okay, and the key is really to, to sketch this. You want to plot it in all the intermediate steps, and then if the speed c is, for example, equal to one, you consider time steps of unit length, and at each time step, each feature of the graph. So, for instance, this lower corner, this upper corner, upper corner, and lower corner, they just move towards the right at a unit um, distance. Okay. The version, so this, this in fact was the 2017-18, I think if you look at the 2017-18 exam, um, this was the, the exact question that we asked students to do during that year. Um, and then a little bit later, a year later in the 2018-19 exam, I made it slightly harder and I gave a slightly harder profile, but it's the same basic idea. Okay? Um, so let's do the problem set 9 question. Let, let's put it up on the screen so we can have a look at it. And uh, this question is slightly more difficult because the profile is slightly more difficult. So where are we right now in the context of problem set uh, nine? Well, we've covered uh, question one. This was just the wave equation on a, on a finite string with Neumann conditions. Uh, we covered number two. This was the example of the pluck string that was plucked at a distance p. And then finally, um, we have question three, which is about D'Alembert's solution, and question four. Now question three, let's just read it together. Uh, it's just asking you essentially to derive D'Alembert's uh, solution. So it, it says by introducing new independent variables, c is equal to x minus ct and eta is equal to x plus ct, show that the wave equation can be written, the a solution of the wave equation can be written as a function of x minus ct, a right traveling wave, and then x plus ct. So you remember that the combination of x minus ct is right traveling, and then x plus ct is left traveling if t is uh, greater than zero. So this is a matter, this uh, demonstration is a matter of doing a chain rule and converting all your x and t derivatives to these new derivatives, c and eta. And if you've done it properly, you get something that's very easy to integrate, essentially u of c eta, uh, the mixed derivative of u, and then you integrate it twice. And you obtain this. Okay, so this is just book work. If you're not sure how to follow it, then um, have a look at one of the uh, lectures from last week, or have, just have a look at the notes. And then the next question is just a derivation of D'Alembert's solution. So you apply the initial condition to the above solution form that you found, and then you essentially solve a system of two equations for the f and the g functions. And once you've done so, you'll obtain this solution form for D'Alembert's. So again, g of s is equal to zero if the initial velocity is zero and you have the interpretation we, we explained before. 
a wave of half height moving towards the right and a wave of half height moving towards the left. Okay, so parts A and B um, is nothing more than just following your notes and then just making sure that you understand each step along the way. Okay, question four is uh, essentially a more complicated example of trying to sketch the uh, profiles u of xt given initial displacement and remember the initial velocity is zero. Okay, so you're, you're given two um, versions of the question, one in, involving a sinusoidal and one involving a cosine. And what makes this question difficult is not necessarily the sketching itself, um, but it's, it's the fact that th these have the sines and the cosines have somewhat weird inputs of pi x over a, and then you have to think about, oh, what happens if x is less than a or if x is greater than a. Okay, so what makes it difficult is just dealing with the fact that you have a slightly non-standard input into the sine function, and you have to consider it for a general A. Okay, let's turn this off now. So let's do together uh, number 4A, um, and I'll write down parts of the question on the right here, and then we'll do it on the board on the left. So in part 4a, you're given a profile which consists of a sine, pi x over a, so this is part a, problem set number 9, question 3, part a, you're given the fact that u of x0 is equal to sine of pi x over a, and here this is it if magnitude of x is less than or equal to a. Uh, and zero is uh, otherwise. Okay, and then in part b, you have a, a, a very similar set, which is a cosine. All these questions, uh, we mentioned in the last lecture that all these questions are similar in the sense that they're what's called compact support. So you're always given a profile which is basically non-zero in some central section and then zero outside. Or it doesn't have to be a single central section, but the key is that you have to know that it's zero. It's kind of trivial in um, bulks of the domain or big parts of the domain. And the reason why is that if this is not zero, then it makes it really difficult for you to figure out how the addition works, how to apply this solution form. So you do rely upon the fact that it's kind of non-zero and then zero. Okay. So the first step is to, to figure out what all the wavelengths are for this problem. Um, and then also uh, to figure out, given a certain speed c, how much things move um, as a function of the time. Okay. So um, let's just note a few things. So the first thing, let me, let me erase this. We'll remember it. So let's note here that we want to figure out what the, what the wavelength of the sine is. And once we figure it out, then it's a lot easier for us to work in, um, in a proportion of the wavelength. So sine of pi x over a has wavelength. And the wavelength is always 2 pi over the thing in front of the x. So in this case, it's 2 pi over the thing in front of the x is the pi over a. Okay, and then you, you just flip this, so this equals 2 times a. Okay, so the sine has wavelength 2 times a. Let's plot it. So we'll plot at t is equal to 0. Okay, when x is equal to 0, then the sine is 0. Okay, and when x is equal to a, you have sine of pi, which is uh, two minus a here and a here. Okay, so when x is equal to a, you have sine of pi, which is zero, and it goes up and it comes like this, and then you have the other sides. Okay, so this is your wavelength here. Lambda is equal to 2 times a, as we stated, and the, this is the initial profile, and always make sure that you plot the, um, the vertical scale on this so we know. So 
what's going to happen as soon as time starts is that this is going to, you think of this as two profiles lying on top of each other of half height, both of half height, of, half, of height a half, and then one profile splits towards the right and the other one splits towards the left. Uh, now, after a long time, we can just do a little cartoon sketch here of what it's supposed to look like. You would imagine that after a long time, you'll have one profile which moves towards the right like this, the other profile moves towards the right like this, and both have height a half. Okay, so that's what's going to happen after a long time. Uh, obviously, the, the hard bit is figuring out what happens in the intermediate times before they've completely separated. If you wanted to, try to help you figure things out. You can also consider about what's the first time when the profiles are, are such that one is completely on the right and the other is completely on the left, like this. So there's going to be a time when they first have completely separated from, an, from each other. Afterwards, it's very easy to see what the evolution is like. And before that, it's a, it's a lot harder. Right? So that's ultimately the question we need to figure out. And in, in order for us to figure that out, we have to figure out how um, how things are moving. So how does the C, the speed in the problem, relate to the times? Now, the question, if you read the question a little bit more carefully, it's asked you to plot the profiles at different times. And it's asked you to plot the profiles at t is equal to 0, and then at a over 2c and then multiples of that. a over 2c, then 2a over 2c, and then 3a over 2c. Okay, so we need to figure out firstly how much is the profile going to shift in multiples of a over 2c. Okay, so let me erase this. We'll make a, a nice picture in a second. So let's note the speed is c. Okay, and uh, speed times time is basically distance. So I just have to take the speed and then multiply by the multiple time that I'm looking at, and that will tell me how much the profile has shifted. So um, this tells me that in, in t is equal to a over 2c, I'd like to figure out at this first time interval how much the profile has shifted. Uh, the profile moves by c times that, so a distance of a over 2c times c. Right. So it's basically a over 2, and a over 2 is basically one quarter of this lambda. So this is lambda over 4. And, I mean, there's two ways. So you can either think of it as a over 2, and you're happy to work in units of a, or alternatively, you can think about it in multiples of the wavelength, and then you just take a quarter of the wavelength. So at every unit in time, if you think of the unit as a over 2c in time, the profile just moves by a quarter of its length, a quarter of its um, of the, 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 the length that we just drew before. Okay? And that's enough for you. So once you know this fact, that's enough for you to draw the different profiles at the different times. Okay? Let's try it now. So um, we're going to plot four graphs here of these four moments in time. And we've already done the first graph. I'll draw it quite large here, because this has a height of 1. And this goes to a, and this goes to minus a. Okay. And then at the next moment in time, so I do a little t is equal to 0 here. And then this is t is equal to a over 2c. And then down here, I'll do t is equal to uh, 2a over 2c. And over here, I'll do t is equal to 3a over 2c. Okay, now, actually, this one is easier. This, this is probably the harder profile to draw. So let's plot this one first, 2a over 2c. Now, we know that basically at each moment in time, if I split the wave 
So this is one wavelength here from, that runs from minus A to A. At each moment in time, each point on this graph, so you think of this as essentially two profiles of half height, one half. One splits to the right, one splits to the left. And at each moment for these three units in time, each uh, point in this picture will shift towards the right by one quarter of the wavelength, which is this distance here. Okay. So after two um, units in time, this point here has shifted to the right by two one quarter units, one, two. And so this point is now located there. So if I draw that in the lower picture, okay, then I now have one half height. So this is at one half or 0 0.5. And I know that one of these dotted lines is now lying on the, le on the left here. And the other one is the pair on the, on the left. This one moves towards the right, this one moves towards the left. Okay, so this point here has moved to 2a. This point is a, this point is minus a. Okay, so if you add the two together, then, so the, the way that I usually draw this is I draw one in dash, I draw the two individual profiles in dash, and then I draw the, the u profile as a solid. So, you just have that. Okay? If I go one extra unit in time, then again, every feature of this graph is then moved by a quarter of the wavelength to the right. And a quarter of the wavelength is essentially this size here. So after one extra unit in time, this corner for the right traveling wave has moved to this point. So I can draw that now on the left. I'm, I'm doing, again, I'm doing the first, third, and fourth because the second is the harder one to do. The second one has the combined profiles in the middle. So after one extra unit in time, I now have a sine curve. Again, I'll draw a dashed here, like that. And then I'll have another sine curve, like that. And this location here, okay, is A over two. So if I add the two profiles together, I have zero out here, one wave, a central section where it's zero, and then another wave, like that. Yeah, so someone has asked, uh, are we doing this A over 2C? And I'm saying, yes, we are. I'm just leaving it. For a moment later. So these are the easier ones to do. I'm doing them first, okay? And then we'll do this one, which is the middle between this one. Once you know that this is the middle between these two, then it's a lot easier. Okay, so let's plot this second element here. So again, the profile at every unit in time moves a quarter of the wavelength through, and a quarter of the wavelength is basically um, this, this size here. So after the, the first unit in time, this point has moved uh, to, to here. Ah, I'm supposed to do it dotted. And then the other side is dotted as well. And then for the left traveling wave, you have the same profile on the other side. Like that. And then you just have to add the two together. Okay? So this, uh, if you add the two together, then in the area where you only have one dash curve, it just follows that dash curve. And then the area we have the two, the two cancel out in height, so you have zero in the cent central section, and then here like that.
Okay. Uh, anything else to mention? This is half here. Okay. Now this is this previous point, which was at a, has moved now to a over two. So this is basically three a over two. This point that used to be at minus a is now at minus three a over two. Okay. And then in the nodal section here, uh, which was at zero, has now moved to a over two. So this is a. And so this here is at a. Zero, a over two, a, three, a over two. Okay, and the same thing on the left hand side, which I won't write in because. Okay, good. So that's about it. It, it was up to you of whether you want to do the second one last or whether you, you want um, do the second one in sequence, right? I sort of, because this one is, because the third one is the easiest one to do, because it's the point where they first separate, I want to do that one first, um, and then do the fourth one because that's even easier. At that point, they've completely separated. And the second one is the harder one because the second one has that central section where the two curves overlap. Okay, good. So that's about it. Uh, let's uh, plot this in MATLAB so we can sort of just confirm how it looks like and then we'll go on to the, the, the last one. I've written a MATLAB code that doesn't rely upon, uh, because last time I published it in Mathematica and someone had asked, oh, is there a way for me to, um, to plot it if I don't have Mathematica? And so I, I just decided just to do a MATLAB version of the code. So let me just show you that here. Uh, this is a simpler version of the code. There's nothing uh, particularly complicated about this code. It just essentially sets a wave speed one. It creates a point from minus five to five with 500 of them. And then it just basically moves in time. This is a little loop that is going to skip forward 30 time steps and each time add um, 0 0.05 to the time. And then finally, you have to have a function here which defines the initial condition. So this is what I call my f. My f just takes in a value x, and then it sets it to what the initial condition is supposed to be. So there's a trick to specifying this my f function, which I show you here, which is that I, I'm doing currently a profile, which is 2 in a central section and then 0 outside. So this was the one that we, we looked at in the last lecture. And the trick to doing it is basically you set the initial value to be 2 and then depending on whether x is less than minus 1 or greater than 1 I just set it to be 0. So let me show you what this looks like. Uh, just put a pause command into here so it doesn't move too quickly. And this is a typo. So this is the initial profile that you see. It's 0, 2, 0. Um, this, this is just a little artifact of the plotting. Don't worry about that. Uh, just because we're using only 500 points. So there's, there's sort of a, a midpoint between here. And what you're expecting to see again is that as, as soon as time starts, the profile is going to split into half its height, one moving towards the right and the other one moving towards the left. So there we are. And that's the, uh, that's the type of solution that we saw um, uh, last time using Mathematica. And also just doing it ourselves on the board, okay? So now let's have a look at what happens if this is a more complicated uh, sine function. So that's what we'll do here. We're just going to uh, define the f to be basically sine of pi times x over a. And here I'll set a to be equal to 1. Okay. So it's the sine of pi times x over a within the central region, where the central region runs from minus a to a. And then you have to go and set everything to be 0 left of the central region. And then everything needs to be set to 0 right of the central region. And then we plot everything. And here I'm considering the wave speed to be 1. Okay, So c is equal to 1. And so this is what it looks like. And there you are. Okay. Now, when I plotted this, you'll see that it, 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 it's a lot, it seems to be a lot more complicated. Let, let's slow down time a little bit. 
let's play it again, you'll see that it's a lot more complicated than what we just drew on the board. And that's because there are intermediate times where it's actually quite difficult to figure out how it adds up, how the two profiles, the one moving right and the one moving left add up. Let's play it again. Ah, I have to go for a bit longer. So I'm just gonna increase the time to 300 instead of 30. play it okay so here we go there we are and then onwards okay. so um, you'll notice let me see if I can just call it while it's happening you'll notice that at, m at moments during that evolution it lined up exactly with the pictures that we had on the board but outside of those moments, it's actually a, perhaps a little bit surprising what it's supposed to look like. So let's plot again, and then I'll see if I can just, um, as it's running, I'll see if I can just call out what the moments in time are. So this is currently at t is equal to zero, profile of height one, and then remember, splits into a half height, profile of speed of, of height a half and minus a half okay so let's run it so the next moment in time that we plotted is about to occur you'll see that it's going to flatten directly on the axis right there that's the first moment in time that we plotted the next moment in time we plotted is the one where they both completely separate so at this moment right now the left one is about to separate the right one is about to separate and then the last moment in time we plotted was around this moment in time here where they have largely separated. So you see, actually plotting it is definitely not a trivial thing outside of those special moments in time, because if you're not at those special moments in time, then it doesn't add up necessarily to something um, that's easy to imagine. Okay, so uh, if you were slightly before this moment in time, for instance, then it's actually quite difficult to figure out how that central section adds up. And that's why the question had asked you only um, at very special uh, moments in time. Okay, good. So let's now go on to the last part of that question where you have, instead of a sine profile, you have a cosine profile. Now, uh, the other thing that I'll mention, it's good for me to show the screen here. The other thing that I'll mention is that there was a typo in the problem set solutions where the axes here were slightly wrong, uh, well, not slightly wrong, they were wrong. Um, previously, this said two and one, and I forgot to have the height here. So on the website, you'll see an updated, um, on the website here, you'll see an updated problem set, it's corrected Q4, question four axis, at uh, 13 April, 2020, okay? And so that has the correction in there. Uh, it, you can also see it in the errata, so it's, as always, see if you check if you if you see a mistake, check the errata firstly um, to see whether it's been mentioned. So it's it's been mentioned in this. It looks like the axes are doubled here. Um, okay. So let's now talk about this uh, last part of the question, which is a cosine pi x over two a profile. Cosine pi x over two a, and you're asked to plot at those same moments in time uh, that we just did. Okay. So we're going to correct this now to cosine pi x over 2a, okay, and then x is less than or equal to a, and uh, it's zero outside of that region. So what's going to be notable here is that the wavelength has changed. And uh, let's see if we can bypass a lot of what we were trying to do before by kind of listing out all those individual properties and see if we can just go ahead and plot it. So we, again, we want to do these four moments in time. And you can start off by just putting in isolated values. So for instance, if x is equal to zero, then you know the cosine function is one. So this starts off at one. 
if x is equal to a, then you have cosine of pi over 2, and you know that the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So this is a here. This is minus a. And you have basically that, and then 0 outside of that integral. OK, so essentially, the, when, when we wrote this down, you'll notice that we put in this extra factor of 2, and that's essentially half the wavelength. Okay, so at the next moment in time, we'll do this one in sequence. At the next moment in time, basically at a over 2, everything moves by speed c, remember? So at a over 2c times c gives you a over 2. So at every moment in these four moments, or these three time steps, the profile has moved by a distance of a over 2, either towards the right or towards the left. Okay, so this left-hand point, if I call this a here, will then move to minus a over 2 for the profile that moves towards the right. And similarly, the profile at this point, let's call it b here, this point will move towards the left to the point a over 2 for the profile that moves left. So again, you'll make one dashed line of height 1 half uh, for the right moving one and then the left moving one. So let's do the right one moving one first. So we know the right moving one, if I call this a minus a here and a here, the right moving one has moved to minus a over 2. So it lies at that location, this point a. On the other hand, the point b here has moved towards the right by a distance of a over 2. And so there's a over 2 here and a over 2. This is 3 a over 2. So this is the point b. This is the point a. And everything is dashed, and it goes up to a height of a half. And then you'll do the same profile. So this profile is moving towards the right. You'll do the same thing, shift each point in their respective directions. This point minus a shifts minus a over 2 to the left. This point b shifts uh, a over 2 to the left, and minus a over 2. And that gives you the left traveling profile, right? So this is the new point. Um, sorry, this is the new point uh, a here. This is minus 3a over 2. Here. And you have that. And then you just have to add the two together. So solid, solid. And then at this point here, this is where you have to think about it. They're both positive, and so you'll lie higher than each individual dashed curve, right? So at this point here, You'll have something that looks like this if you add the two together, and then you follow only the single curve because only the single curve exists after that point. And that's the intermediate profile. Okay? And then finally, you're going to continue on with the evolution. This is now at t is equal to uh, 2a over 2c. At this point, this minus a over 2 for the right traveling profile has moved another a over 2 towards the right, and so it now lies at the origin, whereas this point, which was at a over 2, has moved uh, one point left, or one unit left, which now lies at the origin. So at this point, both of your humps are completely separated. They lie at the origin like this. And it's dashed outside. Outside. And make sure you draw your axes, and then make sure you label some of the points uh, in between. So this is at 0, this is at 2a, this is at minus 2a, and then 0. Okay, so. And then finally, for the very last one, you have 3a over 2c. And you just take each one of these humps and you move them over by a quarter of the wavelength by basically a over 2. So this point here has moved to a over 2. 
and then you have an empty region between like that. This now, which is 2 over a plus 1 quarter, uh, sorry, uh, plus a over 2, is now 5 over 2. And this is at uh, minus 5 over 2. And this is minus a over 2. Okay. This one, sometimes I draw a little arrow as well to indicate the direction. Okay. Uh, very good question. So th there was the question that was asked, which says, does the point at x equal to 0 at t is equal to a over 2c equate to anything uh, we should be able to determine? Yes, of course. So you should be able to determine this height here. Let's see if we can do it. I mean, you're free to, to always add in the points. Uh, so uh, if t is equal to a over 2c, right, and x is equal to 0, then you notice that u of x uh, of 0, and then this is a over 2c. is equal to one half of uh, this initial condition here. So you have cosine of pi over 2a. And then you just have to put in these points here. So you have 0 minus uh, a over 2c. Sorry, a over 2c times c, so that's a over 2. Plus cosine of pi over 2a. And then this is a uh, a over two. So this is a zero, zero minus c times t, zero plus c times t. Um, and there you are. And you'll notice that the cosine is an even function, so the negative doesn't make a difference. And so it's just the value of this thing here. So that looks like pi over four, cosine of pi over four. So this is one half. Uh, 2 times cosine of pi by 4, uh, which is what? Root 2 over 2. So this is root 2 over 2 root 2. So this is, in fact, I think, equal to root 2 over 2. Because cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2 times 2 is a root 2, and so you have outside root 2 over 2. So that looks like to be root 2 over 2. Good question. Okay. That's about it. Um, let's very quickly just plot what this looks like in, in, uh, in MATLAB, just because we have a, the code already. So let's turn this on here. So we just have to change this to a cosine of uh, pi times x over 2a, and again, we'll take a to be equal to 1. And let's go ahead and plot this. Here we are. So it's a central hump of height 1. Then again, the hump will essentially be thought of as being decomposed into two humps of half height, 0 0.5, um, one moving towards the right, the other moving towards the left. And so let's run the evolution and then see as well if we can mention those moments in time that we did actually plot. Let me make this a little bit bigger here. Okay, so now it's uh, been run. So we plot it around that section there where you have the central hump, um, which is a little bit higher. And then we also plotted at this moment in time when they first are completely separate and then we also plotted a little bit after that moment in time where they have um, a gap in between okay this function is a, you see this function was a lot easier to to construct compared to the sine because the function is always positive so you're always adding positive area to positive area 
Whereas with the sign, there were locations where they would cancel out because there's a, there's a, um, there was a part in which it was negative for the sinusoidal function. Okay, there we are. Now, uh, let's go back to the problem set and then just kind of finish it up. Here we are. Okay, so we've just finished question four. This is just asking you to, to make those sketches and we've done so. Now moving to part B. In part B, you'll notice that um, this first part of the question is, is asking you, let's go back to the wave equation, utt is equal to c squared uxx, and do the separation of variables again. So this is just again Fourier series for a, uh, a finite interval with zero Dirichlet conditions. And it's essentially just asking you what happens if uh, these constants are positive, zero, um, or negative. Um, and we've done this in the lecture notes. We've gone through, not sorry, not in the lecture notes, in the video lecture. So if you refer to the video lectures from last week, we went through all the different cases of what happens if this constant is positive, negative, and zero. Um, so this question is just asking you to duplicate those precise notes. Then the, the, the punchline is that uh, essentially you only have to consider those modes which return cosines and sines. You don't have to consider those ones that re, uh, return exponential growth and decay. And for the zero Dirichlet case, you don't have to consider the zero mode, the one where you have C is equal to zero. But for the Neumann condition problem, the zero Neumann condition where you have the derivatives at both ends equal to zero, you have to consider the c is equal to zero case. Okay, so again, just refer to the lecture notes from last week to see how that's been done. Okay, finally, the problem set is asking you in question number six, consider the wave equation utt is equal to c squared uxx defined for the vertical displacement of a 1D string. Discuss the physical interpretation of the Dirichlet and Neumann conditions in terms of the quantities of displacement and force. Okay, so I can do this quite quickly just before we um, finish the video. So it's asking you to just give physical interpretation of what the boundary conditions are. So let's consider the boundary condition on the left. And let's consider it to be a Dirichlet condition, okay, u of zero and t. What that simply corresponds to, as you can imagine, is setting the height here to be c. Okay, so it's a string. For example, I might clamp one end at zero to be zero, uh, at L to be zero, and then clamp the other at x equal to zero to be a height of c. That's what a Dirichlet condition is, just setting the height of this. Point. Though we didn't do it in this course, we could as well consider c to be a function of t. So I can think of um, an input, I'm going to fix the left-hand side of the string so that it's going up and down or, or moving in some specified manner c of t, okay? And we didn't do that uh, in this course, but we could have equally done. We could have done examples for that. The sneakier condition to talk about is the, the Neumann, con uh, is the ux condition, okay? So the question here is if I set this, if I set the derivative of the function equal to a constant or equal to zero or, um, or equal to a function, how do you physically interpret that? Now, there's kind of two interpretations that I'll share. Uh, the, the most straightforward one is that this is setting the gradient of the function at the origin, right? So I have a string of length L, and you're essentially thinking of, I'm going to clamp the string. So it's like, you're going to clamp it at some angle here that, so that the gradient of this function, the gradient of that is equal to C. So this ux here is equal to c. If ux is equal to zero, is then it's like considering a string or a beam which is being clamped at the horizontal. Um, and if it's uh, if ux is equal to one, then it's like at an angle of uh, of forty five degrees. Okay, that's the most simple interpretation of what that condition corresponds to. It simply means I'm going to fix the angle of my string on the left rather than fixing the displacement of the string, which is a Dirichlet condition. Okay. Now the other way of think there's another way of thinking about this condition in terms of forces. Okay. 
And the way that you can think of it is that you have to go back to your derivation of the wave equation. In the derivation of the wave equation, you'll remember that we considered the forces on a little segment of the string. And we said that this string is at a tension t. This is the internal force on the string. And if I call this angle theta, then this segment is t times cosine of theta, and this segment is t times sine of theta. So these quantities, t cosine theta and t sine theta, correspond to the horizontal and vertical forces, which are um, decomposed, uh, which uh, uh, the horizontal and vertical forces which make up the force t. Okay, and so, if I think of t sine of theta, you'll, you'll remember that when we derived the wave equation, we did a series of approximations for this theta, um, which was based on the fact that the wave, the string, was only weakly deflected, small deflections. We said, firstly, that if sine of theta is basically, um, if I use a small angle approximation for theta, then this is like t of theta. And then secondly, this is essentially t times du of dx. Okay, and we did this sort of. Uh, you, you don't have to think too hard about it. There's, there are many ways of doing this approximation. You can think of theta as basically um, the tan of the function of dy or dx, and this is basically dy uh, du over dx, and this is du over dx. Okay, so this is just trigonometry. Okay, so the tan is basically opposite over adjacent. Tan of opposite over adjacent is equal to theta. And then this is just a small angle approximation. In other words, as long as your string is weakly deflected, then the vertical force is equivalent to the derivative. In other words, when you set a condition on the derivative, you're basically setting a condition on the vertical force. Okay, so that's how you interpret it. So du dx, um, I'll, I'll write it in the, in the other way, ux at zero t equal to c is basically, you're setting the vertical force Uh, proportional to C. Proportional because there's other scalings in this. I mean, when you're considering force, you also have the tension to consider. So you're saying it's proportional to C. In particular, if C is equal to zero, then you can think of it again in two ways. If I tell you to model a string where the left-hand boundary has ux equal to zero, you can think of it as a system where you're clamping the string to be at a horizontal always, or you can think of it as it's a system where I don't impose a vertical force on the problem. Okay, and now let's try to think about how to imagine that kind of situation. If you imagine a situation where you're standing here and you're holding a string which is connected to a hoop, which lies along a pole, and there's no friction on this hoop, and so the hoop is allowed to move up and down freely, then this is essentially a Neumann condition. This is a ux equal to zero condition. Okay? So if, if, if I say, let's model a problem where the right-hand derivative is equal to zero, you can think, right, the derivative is proportional to the force, so as long as the string is weakly deflected, this condition is uh, equivalent to imposing zero vertical force. And that's equivalent to considering fixing a hoop to a pole and then kind of um, looking at the evolution of the, of, of the string on that system. Okay. Okay. Good. So I think that's about it. Uh, there is this last question, which I don't have time to look into. Um, sorry, I don't have time to answer at the moment. But there is a really interesting question about how do we interpret the solutions of this in terms of strings? Because when you have D'Alembert solution, it's on an infinite interval. 
and it's quite difficult for us to imagine how that works in terms of these analogies with the strings. And I've not explained that because I need a little bit more time to explain that, and so I'll see if I can pick that up on the next lecture. Um, we've covered problem set number nine, we've covered question three, uh, question four, and question six. So this basically takes you to all the way to the end of, uh, of problem set nine. You'll be able to fill in all the other questions based on all the lecture material we did before, and we also did question one um, in the lectures we did before. That basically concludes the uh, D'Alembert solution, other than these isolated questions, which, which, which I have to address. Um, but then we're going to look forward to moving on to problem set number 10 and then looking at uniqueness. And that will be basically it for the actual problem set uh, portion of the course. And then, of course, the, the very interesting maths and music. Uh, someone's asked, OK, so uh, there's a question about how the extra 20% of the exam, um, what, what the impact of that extra 20% of the exam is, OK? Uh, so just to repeat, your assessment, and I, I'd, I'd rather go into more detail about the assessments um, in, a later, in a later lecture, but it's just worth finishing the, the lecture off with, with, with the statement. The way the assessment works is that whatever exam we designed uh, for you to have written before the university was disbanded, this is basically going to form 80% of the bulk of the exam. Okay, so the exam has been the exam which is now open book and is kind of, you do it at home. The exam has been lengthened to be uh, two hours in length, okay? And that part that we wrote for you to do at the university is worth 80% of your mark. So there's this extra 20% business, which is going to be used, this, this is where you put that extra time that the exam has been lengthened to. I mean, if, if you want to think about uh, time in that way. Uh, what's the, uh, what was, pre I've, I've completely forgotten what your typical exam, what's the length of the typical exam? What is the typical length of the exam? So it's usually two hours, and I can't quite remember what, what, the, um, what, what the math department said that, that the, the new exam is, but you, you essentially have 24 hours to submit it. Okay. Yeah, so it's it, it, it was uh, two hours for 60 marks. Okay, so now now your official time is three hours. So it, it looks like you can check the email, it's, it's essentially three hours. I don't quite think of it in terms of three hour segments, but basically whatever you were supposed to write at the university before is now worth 80%. There's an extra 20% question. The, I, I, I don't wanna kind of put words into what the DOS team intended, but essentially, the extra 20% is to allow for extra separation of grades because you're expecting that students will do better on the 80% portion because you get to do it at home with open book. So a lot of the questions which were intended for you to, to cite and to memorize isn't, are no longer going to be um, valid in the same way that it was intended. Okay, any other questions before we disband? Oh yeah. Okay. So, uh, no. So the the so we've been asked to um, essentially dispense of part marks in the question. So you'll notice that when you get your assessments, and I hope this is true. It's certainly true of what what I proposed. Um, so previously we had a breakdown. So each individual question was broken down into sub marks, and that's been removed. So you'll see when you get the assessments, you'll see that there's essentially one mark for each question. So question one has X marks, question two has X, Y marks, and so forth and so on. Um, and the assessment that I put forth, I don't have part marks anymore. So in question one, A, B, C, and D, there are no part marks for that question. Basically, the marks are compressed. If you do perfect, 
Um, if you do perfect on the questions before the open-ended question, you will get 80% on your exam. And then you do the, the open-ended question, and that gives you the extra 20%. Okay? Everything is essentially, essentially just weighted down to be 80%, whereas previously it was 100%. Does that make sense? I don't know anything about uh, exam timetables. Um, and I, I mean, I, yeah, so we're, we're still waiting to find out what the timetable is. And I don't know anything about whether it's been delayed or not. I try my best to keep my nose out of um, those type of decisions. Yeah. I mean, just out of curiosity, do you, what is the incentive for them to be delayed? I mean, the lectures are on, they're, they're on time. In fact, for, for ours, we're, we're two weeks, we're going to be two weeks ahead of schedule. Do you, uh, uh, personally, as, as students, do you prefer for the exams to be delayed or not delayed? Yeah, that's right. You just want to know when it is. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah. But I think you just have to give it time. You know, you just have to give everyone time to, to sort this out. Um, and, and the important thing is that you're doing your problem sets and you're watching your lectures um, on time and, and trying to maintain that schedule. No, that's true. I know I, 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 I completely understand. You just want to find out when it is and then to, to plan your life. I think it may... I would just personally, for now, just plan for the exam to be on the, the, the schedule that you had previously. So the exam period was what, what it was set to be previously. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I've gone, I've, I've, I've been a bit naughty with the time, but I've gone way, way over time. Um, just to, just to uh, remark that for the, for the videos I do upload, I do uh, clip. So the start and the end section, so they, they are um, more on time than, than they are in the chat, uh, in the live version. Um, otherwise, uh, let's end it here. I'll see whatever extra questions. If you, if you continue to email me questions, then I'll see if I can also bring them up um, in the live sessions. Um, let's end it here. I'll see you all on Thursday. Otherwise, again, just continue working and continue staying healthy. Um, and I hope you remain sane because I think sanity is, um, sanity is in high demand at the moment. Okay, very good.